good morning, everybody. How many of you ran the marathon? Raise your hand. Smartest people I've ever met. So glad you're at church today. Uh, we wanna welcome Portage, and we wanna welcome those who are online. Everybody, can we put our hands together and say hello? We love you guys. So glad to be with you. Glad you're here. And this is Red Hot. This is week number one of Red Hot. So this is actually, actually our third service we had last night and then this morning already. Some great questions that have been asked uh, Bible and theology, kind of general uh, questions that we'd like to know from the Bible. We live in a day and age where, you know, people have a lot of questions. If you Google search questions about the Bible, I mean, lists and lists and lists of things come up, partly because uh, we're not necessarily a culture where everybody goes to church and gets a biblical foundation, and also because there are a lot of rumors, misinformation that's being communicated about God, the Bible, Jesus, Christianity. And so Red Hot is an opportunity for you and those who are joining us online to interact and ask questions and see if we can draw some conclusions from Scripture. Let me just say at the beginning, the point of Red Hot is not for me to show you how much I know. Uh, I've been serving Jesus for a very long time, and if you came here thinking that I know all the answers, I will tell you that I have a lot of questions myself. Uh, however, there are some things that I know that I'm confident of. I know the, the scripture. I don't know the Bible because I'm a pastor. I'm actually a pastor because I fell in love with Jesus and was drawn to the word of God, and I love to teach the Bible. So this is like me being a kid in a candy store. It's going to be so much fun, and uh, the temperature is getting hotter in the room already. I can feel red hot. So down the front row, I had my red bowl, and we're ready to go. So let's look at the first question. Is Abraham considered the smartest man in the Bible since he knew a lot? <laughs> Question submitted by John Zonervan. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and John is one of them, and so are you. All right, so uh, great question. Let's take a real question. It seems like there are a lot of things that apply specifically to Jews or Gentiles. How do we know what applies to us and what was fulfilled by Jesus? That's a great question. Uh, it's the, in theological terms, it's called the, the subject of continuity. And so obviously, if you, if you don't know, the Bible is divided into two parts. Old part is, the, the first part is called the Hebrew Scriptures, and the second part is called the New Testament Christian scriptures. And so the first half of the Bible is a revelation of God to a man named Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. Israel becomes God's covenant nation. The reason why God chose Abraham as a man, Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was just a man that lived in the Middle East that God chose, sovereignly elected to be his starting point in bringing redemption to the whole world. In fact, if you read Genesis 12, Genesis 15, when God called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees, which is modern day Iraq, uh, Mesopotamia area, he said, the reason why I'm calling you is I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna give you a land, but through the way I bless you and your descendants, I'm going to bring blessing to all the other nations of the world. So Abraham was God's starting point, but he wasn't his finish line. The finish line was that through his relationship with Abraham, he would bring about redemption. So Abraham had Isaac, the covenants renewed. Isaac had Jacob, the covenants renewed. Jacob becomes Israel, and then Israel has 12 sons. Those became the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the Old Testament is the story of how God interrelated with Israel and revealed himself and his purpose for redemption in the earth through Israel. Those people became Jews. Out of the line of Abraham, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, was born of the Virgin Mary from the line of David, David being the rightful king and heir of the nation of Israel, and God made many promises to David that are fulfilled in Jesus. Now, when we get to Jesus, what happens is something powerful happens at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. It's called the gospel, and the gospel is primarily carried on into the New Testament. What we see is that God does away with the requirements of the Mosaic law that had been given to Moses and the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. 
the law was never given, and it was never meant to be a means by which people were saved. It was, it was kind of like guardrails. How many of you have ever gone bowling and thrown the ball in the gutter? Anybody ever done that? Okay. Have you ever gone bowling where they put inflatables in the gutter so that you stay in the lane? Anybody ever done that? That was like my third date with Jane. We did it, and she still got a gutter. The ball rolled on top of the inflatable. I don't know how it happened. But it's meant so that as the ball moves down the aisle, or the aisle, aisle, lane, thank you, uh, that it would bounce. And that's what the law was meant to be. According to Galatians, Paul says it was meant to be a tutor to keep you in the bounds of morality that would ultimately lead you to Jesus. It would lead you to Jesus, number one, because it would keep you, the Jewish people, as a distinct people, holy unto God. And it would lead you to Jesus, too, because the law would prove to you that you can't save yourself. That no matter how hard you try, here's God's perfect law, you're an imperfect person, it would con continually bring up your need of a savior and then God brought Jesus. When Jesus came, much of the Old Testament requirements, regulations were done away with or fulfilled in Jesus. And then in Jesus what happened is God broke down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. So now everybody who comes into a relationship with God becomes a descendant of Abraham. Whether it's in the flesh, you're a Jew, or whether it's not and you're a Gentile, we all come to Jesus, find our salvation and restoration unto the Father. There are promises in the scripture that God specifically made as an everlasting covenant to Abraham and his physical descendants, and those covenant promises will be fulfilled in the future when Jesus returns and establishes the Davidic, the throne of David, the millennial kingdom of God on the earth and fulfills all those promises ultimately, but all of us by faith are children of Israel. So we don't keep the law. The law is still righteous and perfect, but now the law is written on our heart and we're led not by tablets of stone, but by the spirit of God. Thank God for that, that we are inheritors of the promises of Abraham. So just like I said, Father Abraham had many sons. Some of them are Jewish. Some of them are Gentile. All of them are by faith in Jesus' name. All right? Um. Second question, what would you say to someone who thinks the God of the Bible is a misogynist? So in other words, anti-women. I would, uh, and we live in a culture right now in, in a time frame where there is a lot of change and transformation that's taking place in our culture and in a social media driven culture, information is moving at the sound, sign of thumbs, at, at the speed of thumbs. I mean, everybody's tweeting everything, and there is a common misconception that Christianity is, a, is based on a patriarchal, misogynist system, that God does not like women, and that women are less than in the kingdom of God. And let me just dispel that rumor, uh, because that is not at all true. The Bible does not reflect that. What is reflected in the Bible is people that God revealed himself to who were living in the midst of misogynistic times and patriarchal systems, but those systems were fallen systems. They're sin-infected uh, sin systems. So for example, in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, you are viewing people who are living in the midst of the Iron Age who... Women were considered property. You could have polygamy. There was lots of different things that were taking place. God didn't build that system. That system is there as a result of man's sin. But yet God reveals himself to people with a trajectory of bringing them to a greater reality, but he has to first call them out of that culture. We know this as followers of Jesus living in our own culture. The hardest thing that we do is live countercultural because the pressure that is applied not only in our own thinking and the world around us. So it's like we read the pages of scripture and you know Jesus says some pretty countercultural stuff. And so as Americans we read it and we try and reinterpret it or we ignore it. Why? It's because we're Americans living in a, in a certain kind of culture and it's hard for us. Well, it was hard for them too. So everything that's written in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is not doctrinal where you need to replicate it. So people say, well, you know, the Bible teaches polygamy so I can have multiple wives. Well, the Bible talks about murder too, but it doesn't say go and murder somebody. It's telling a narrative and a story. So let me say this, that from the beginning, God created humankind 
And in Genesis chapter two, it says, and in his own image, he made them male and female. He created them. So God created male and female as an expression of mankind. And it says he blessed them. And he related to them as a father. And he loved them. In the New Testament, when we come to Christianity, Christianity is not patriarchal and not misogynistic whatsoever. Christianity is the most culturally subversive faith that has ever appeared on the face of the earth. And it is the most freeing, egalitarian faith that has ever emerged on the face of the earth. For example, Christianity emerged in the Middle East, but primarily in a Roman, Greco-Roman culture. So many of the things that are in the New Testament, and maybe next week when we get to relationships, we can talk about some more of those things. Many things that people interpret in the New Testament as being anti-women are actually exactly the opposite. They're actually counterculture in favor of women. So for example, head covers. Anybody ever heard of women wearing head coverings? There's 1 Corinthians chapter, I think it's chapter 10 or 11, or it says a woman when she prays should wear a head covering and that type of thing. People look at that and go, that's misogynistic. Well, it's because you're reading that through your American filter. Let me tell you why it's countercultural. Because in Greco-Roman culture, the only women who were allowed to wear head coverings were women that were from respectable families. But in the church, you had women who were being saved out of prostitution and idolatry who in a Greco Roman culture would never have been allowed to wear a head covering because they are women of disrepute. When Paul encourages all women to wear head coverings, he's doing that because in Christ, when you get saved and redeemed, you are brought into the family of God at a higher level. Your sins are forgiven. You're given just as much freedom as a woman who comes from a respectable family. So, I mean, it's actually, it's actually the opposite. Well, you don't wear a head covering because it's not a cultural thing. And that day, if you didn't wear a head covering, it meant you were sexually available, you were a prostitute. So if you were like Mary Magdalene who got saved out of prostitution, culture would have said, no, that's your stigma and it's your mark. You, ha- you, have to con- you never wear a head covering. But when you come into the church at Corinth, Paul says, no, it doesn't matter. Your sins have been forgiven cover your head because it shows that you are a daughter of God. That's what it means when you're under authority for the sake of the angels. It's a declaration. You've been forgiven. You're a daughter of God. Galatians says this, in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. In Jesus, all of those barriers are broken down and we are brought near rich, poor, free slave, Jew, Gentile, male or female. We all have equal footing with God before God and every human being is created equal in the sight of God. So praise Jesus for that, right? Okay, next question. This is Ramy, I think, uh, or Rami, Ramy, uh, great name. How can you explain all the killing in the Old Testament by God's people. How is this consistent with what is taught in the New Testament? Well, probably the mo- one of the most difficult issues that we deal with uh, when we get to the Old Testament is the issue of violence. Uh, and especially living on the other side of the cross and the resurrection. We all look back through the lens of Jesus back onto the Old Testament and we say, well, this seems incompatible with this. Let me answer a few things. Number one, as I said previously, all the violence that we see in the Old Testament is not necessarily sanctioned by God. Okay, some some is, but not all. Number two, whenever you see violence or whenever you see war and those kinds of things, understand that is not God's ideal. Violence and war is never God's ideal. When God created Humankind, and he created the world, he created everything good. Death was not a part of God's original design. Death is the result of human beings rejecting God's authority and choosing to take matters into our own hands. And God told us, he warned us, the day that you do this, death sets in. One of the extensions of death is hatred, it's racism, it's violence, it's war. The Bible says in Isaiah that when Jesus comes back and establishes the kingdom, he's gonna be all the the spears into pruning hooks and all the swords into plowshares. It's gonna do away with war. War is a reality only because sin is a reality in our world. And so God dealing with inhuman history to bring about redemption had to have a starting point. And the starting point was a man who then became a nation who then had a land. And so one of the reasons, a lot of times when people read the Old Testament violence stuff and say, well, why did God sanction the Israelites to go in and 
utterly destroy and utterly kill these civilizations like AI and the Canaanites and those kinds of things. Well, number one, you need to go and you need to research Judges, Joshua, and you need to understand the, the language of it and the why of it. Most, uh, so let me, let me give you bullet points. I would love to, I probably should spend like a half an hour on a question like this. But number one, uh, the nations that God commanded them to go in and destroy are the same nations that postpone God bringing Abraham's descendants into the promised land. He told Abraham, I'm sending you into Egypt, into slavery for 400 years because the sins of the Amorites and sins of the Canaanites has not yet, the evil of the Canaanites has not risen to a level where I have to judge them. God always has to judge sin. Sin has to be judged. And when sin is consistently encouraged and embraced and we reject the mercy of God, it puts us in proximity to judgment. So God gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent. We don't know how he did it, but we knew that he gave them 400 years. Maybe he sent prophets to them. Maybe he dealt with their conscience. But what we also know about the Canaanite people is that in that 400 years, they became evil and diabolical. They were demonic worshipers. They offered their children in sacrifice to Molech. They were incredibly violent. They, you want to talk about war, when Israel went against them, Israel was outnumbered 10 to 1. And these were slaves, they were not soldiers. They were going up against soldiers into the land because God had promised them the land. And before they ever went to war, they gave fair warning. God sent pestilence in to drive them out. Most of the Canaanites at that time, historians and Old Testament scholars believe, most of them had, they'd sent their families into the mountains they had left in the cities like Ai and Jericho were actually more like military installations. So when they came up to these cities, they were fighting against hardened, demon-possessed soldiers who had resisted the grace of God for 400 years. And God said this, when you come up against them and they fight against you, utterly destroy them. How is an army that's not trained in war, is outnumbered 10 to 1, going up against special forces, how is that genocide? It's not. They were coming against them, they gave them fair warning, but the land was promised to them because God needed a starting point. He needed to get a people deeply entrenched into a land so that the rest of his redemptive purposes and plans could come to pass. And so God's working within a fallen world and with fallen people. Actually, one more thing I'll add, and I've got 18 seconds, is, which is tough to do. Uh, if you're really, really interested in this, there's several different books that are out there written by scholars, like uh, Did God Really Command Genocide? It's one book. There's another one, uh, Is God a Moral Monster? It's another one that talks about it. And it talks about the language that is used in Iron Age, uh, Middle Eastern literature, which the Bible is considered part of that. And so when they use language like utterly destroy, utterly devastate, or leave not one alive, what you'll find is that Israel never did that. And that kind of language is actually Iron Age Middle Eastern language for total victory. It's not literal. It would be like you watching um, you know, watching uh, the Pistons in the playoffs, which, well, let's use a better example. How about <laughs> Golden State in the, playing against, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of their arch rivals, and they win by 30 points, and you say they utterly destroyed them. They kill, it's hyperbole, hyperbolic military language that talks about a complete victory. And it was a complete victory, not by their own hands. It was a complete victory by the grace of God. And here's the last thing I will say about that. Last thing I'll say about that is, at the end of the day, we can't use the Old Testament to invalidate what we know about Jesus in the New Testament. We know a lot more about God and who he is and what he's called us to be as his people now than they did back then. God was working within a framework trying to reveal more and more of himself. It's called pro progressive revelation. That revelation was finalized in Jesus Christ. So when people try to use Old Testament violence language to justify violence today, we go to Jesus first and we let Jesus interpret the Old Testament. We don't let the Old Testament interpret Jesus. Does that make sense? 
Okay, that's just a snippet of how I would explain that. It's a big question. If you're interested, here's what I would tell everybody. Don't just sit back and think, well, I can't serve Jesus until I get all my questions answered. Hey, if you've got questions, God's got answers. Dig into it. If we spend as much time digging into the questions we have in the Old Testament and the New Testament or that skeptics have that we do on Facebook and Instagram, we would all be a lot better off. Can I get a hearty amen in Jesus' name? Okay. This is Jake from Portage, versions of the Bible, American Standard Version, New Amer- International Version, NLT. Are we choosing how we want to hear the message? Okay, so Jake, what you're referring to, and maybe those who aren't aware, obviously there's many different translations of the Bible that are out there. Uh, I grew up in a time frame, I'm, I turned 48 tomorrow, uh, and when I grew up, there was like King James. NIV and the Living Bible, that was it. And you could get it in two colors. You could get it in black and you could get it in burgundy, maybe brown, that was it. Uh, The Living Bible was green. Anybody remember that? You had a green hardcover Bible. Now we've got like 90 translations and you can get it in leather, ostrich skin, pleather, two-tone. You can get it in a tin can. You can get it with study notes. You can get it for third shift Slurpee repairman at the 7-Eleven. We've got all kinds of Bibles out there. Um. So what I will say about Bible translations is that all, oh, oh, let me back up. Most Bible translations are helpful. Not all Bible translations are equal. So the easiest way to describe it is this. Bible translations are translated by committees. That way it's not one person's translation. You get the best scholars in Hebrew, English, or Hebrew, English, and Greek Aramaic, some of it, Chaldean, and you bring them together and they form committees to translate it in committee. That's why you get safeguards, okay? So if you get an individual uh, translation by somebody like the Phillips translation, that's one man's translation. Then within translation, there are two schools of thought. One's called uh, the equivalent dynamic school and the other's called literal word-for-word dynamic. So Uh, Like if you have an NIV, if you have a New Living Translation, uh, or I'm trying to think of a a few others, but those those are primarily NIV and New Living Translation. Those are what are called dynamic equivalent. And what that means is the scholar sits down with the literal Greek, and I'm talking New Testament, and Greek is not structured the way English is. And so you would have to move words around. Then you also have idioms and metaphors that make sense to the culture of Greek-speaking people that doesn't make sense to us in English. So scholars have, they have to make the decision, okay, are we going to translate this word for word even though it's choppy, or are we going to translate it thought for thought and try and make it apply to today's culture and language in the way it would have back then? So for example, um, measurements. Instead of using pounds and feet and ounces, it will use shekels and, you know, all kinds of different measurements, uh, omers and things that that we don't use, but you'd have to go and figure out what that means. Or do we just translate it into the equivalent of pounds? Well, equivalent dynamic people, NIV, NLT, translate the Bible thought for thought. But when you get to King James, which is hard to read because it's 400-year-old language, New King James or English Standard Version, which is the translation that I preach from, uh, New Revised Standard Version, uh, then those are what are called literal word-for-word translations. So the committee translated as close to the word-for-word as they can, and they said, we're gonna translate God's word word word-for-word, and we're gonna let you figure out what the thought is. You'll have to dig a little bit deeper. So one is for readability, the other is for accuracy. So here's, and then you've got a few things like the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. The Passion Translation is a very loose, dynamic translation. Living Bible, the same way. I think things like the Message and Living Bible and those kinds of things are good supplemental devotional tools to read. Uh, but they can't become your main Bible. You need, my, my perspective is the more intensely you study the scripture, the more literal you want the translation. I don't want somebody telling me what they think it means. I wanna read it word for word. I want the Holy Spirit to help me. I wanna do some hard work. I wanna think about it and I wanna chew on it and I wanna get, I want word for word. 
If somebody comes to me and says, hey, I met this person and they told me some really important news. And I say, well, what did they say? And then they go, well, kind of generally the summation is it kind of said this. And I'm like, no, tell me word for word what they say. How many know? When I come home, Jane is a detail girl. She's like, how was your day? Good. No, tell me details. So I met with this person, blah, 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 blah. We want details. And I want word for word. So that's why I preach from the English Standard Version. Uh, another great translation is the New King James translation. Uh, I, for many, many years, uh, preached out of that, studied out of that. But my encouragement would be uh, have a main Bible that is a literal dynamic that you read and then have supplemental equivalent dynamic and paraphrases that you can kind of supplement and you can study. But we do live in a day and age where biblical illiteracy is skyrocketing. People's reading skills is not necessarily great. And uh, so I think we need to redeem that, right? And uh, we need to be Bereans people of the word. So that's that. Another question. This is Katie from online. Thank you, Katie. How do I, you, anyone, truly know that we have a spiritual gift from God? How do we use it in the right way? Um, the way that we know, that's a, by the way, that's a great question. A lot of people have questions about spiritual gifts. How do we know what spiritual gift that we have? Well, like any gift, the way that we receive anything from God is by faith. So uh, number one, I would say this. If we're talking about spiritual gifts, and we're talking about maybe the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that are manifestations of the Spirit that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, or whether it's some of the motivational giftings that are listed in Romans chapter 12, like encouragement, exhortation, generosity, service, uh, all of those, realize that all of those gifts are manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit, which means you have the capacity to function in all those gifts already deposited in you, because the one who is the gift giver is inside of you. He's willing to give them to us as it pleases him. So there's sometimes where God gives us sovereign gifts, grace gifts that are predominant in our lives. And then there's other times where Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, zealously pursue spiritual gifts. So it's up to us to say, I want these gifts. And the two kind of work together. The Holy Spirit, certain times and seasons of our life will give us gifts, and then there's us pursuing and growing in those gifts. Here's what we can't do. It's like anything else with God. We can't just sit back and go, okay, God, if you want to give it to me, give it to me. And we expect like Amazon Prime truck to pull up in front of our house and a guy to walk up and go, here's the gift of prophecy. And you take it and it's like a USB drive that you shove into your head and all of a sudden now you prophesy over everybody. If you're expecting that to happen, it's not going to happen. The way that we grow, identify gifts is, I think, in the discipleship context. I think as we're pursuing Jesus and we ask for gifts, we ask for the different gifts, then he is faithful to give them to us, and then by faith, we exercise them. And the more you exercise something, the more confident and mature you grow in that gift. And so I had somebody come up a couple weeks ago and, and say to me, um, I feel like I might have the gift of prophecy. How do I know that? And I said, well, what does the Bible say prophecy is? Well, and they said, I, I know it's in 1 Corinthians. I said, right, 1 Corinthians. And it says that it is for exhortation, encouragement, and edification, where God speaks to us out of his word a lot of times, but sometimes he'll just deposit things he wants us to share from his heart through us to somebody else. And I said, so are, how do you think that you're getting the gift of prophecy? I don't know, I'm around people and like, I get a scripture that comes to my mind for that person. I'm like, that's a gift of prophecy. And they're just like, well, how do I know? By faith. You just say, okay, I got the scripture. I'm looking at you. I feel like God wants me to use it to encourage you. So go try it. And if it encourages somebody, guess what? It's prophecy. Now, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have a word from God, and it's, you know, it's out of Ezekiel where it says that you're gonna consume your own children because God has turned his back on you. Does that encourage? No. Does that exhort? No. Does that edify? No. That's not prophecy. So, yes, no. Okay. So, the more you do it, the more sensitive you become to the voice of God. When you get married, you know somebody, but it takes, I've been married to Jane for 27, going on 28 years. Uh, we're growing and knowing each other. Sometimes I can know what she's going to say before she says it. 
Anybody like that? Commercial pops up on TV and I know exactly what she's gonna say. It's like, I've just been around you too long. I just know it. Or I know her voice more. Or I know what she's saying, even though she's saying something. Like, hey, did you see that the garbage is full? She's not looking for factual information. <laughs> she's like, why don't you stop what you're doing, go get the garbage, take it out. Right? You learn that. Well, you learn the voice of God in the same way. You grow in your faith as you exercise spiritual gifts. And uh, I think, by the way, community groups, small groups, if you're not involved in one, you're missing out because discipleship happens in smaller clusters. When we get to know each other, we eat Doritos together, we pray together, and we practice spiritual gifts, and we share what God's doing in our lives. So if you're not in a community group or a life group or whatever we call them, connect groups now, what are they called now? Groups. If you're... If you're not in a group, get in a group and practice, study about the gifts of the Spirit. Here's what I know. The last thing I'll say about that is if you step out in faith and practice, God's not going to be mad at you. God's not like, oh, you blew it. Whistle, technical foul, get on the bench. God loves the fact that we're trusting him. And the reason why it's not more obvious is because he wants, as we pursue things from him, he wants us to grow more dependent upon him. And that, like childlike faith, that we need him, okay? So let's go to another question. Do prodigals who once accepted Christ as their saviors, but who have not, or savior, but who have not come back to the Lord still go to heaven? And that's from Kayla in Portage. So for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with that language, a prodigal uh, is an illustration that Jesus gave in probably his greatest parable about the, the prodigal son. And so we use the term prodigal to speak of those who at one time apparently had a walk with God, a belief in God, relationship with God, but have since walked away from that. And so when it, somebody comes, somebody has come to faith and then they've walked away from the Lord and we call that a prodigal. So, and the questions are really good questions. So uh, when somebody is a prodigal and at one point they, they accepted Christ as their savior, uh, but then they don't come back to the Lord, do they still go to heaven? And uh, let me just say, number one, at the end of the day, who goes to heaven, who goes to hell is not my determination, it's not yours. Uh, and I think we need to realize that there is a, a real hell. So I know that we, we have a hard time wrestling with the issue that real people who've lived real lives one time or another, ultimately, many will reject Christ and will spend an eternity separated from God in hell. And as C.S. Lewis says, hell is a room that is locked from the inside. In other words, we go to hell. If we end up in hell, it's because we climbed over the obstacles that God put in our way because we wanted it our way. And ultimately, God says, have it your way. But... It's not our determination. I can't tell you who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. But I can tell you that the Bible's very clear. And sometimes we assume that people are Christians for all the wrong reasons. So we assume, well, they go to church, okay? Or we think that somebody's a Christian because they say, well, I believe in God. So, we, well, they gotta be a Christian. Or... Even closer to home, we have some people who say, well, I believe in Jesus. But it, the Bible's very clear in James. It says that the actions and the fruit of our life, our faith actions, are actually the proof of the validity of our faith in Christ. Jesus himself said this, and this should, sh this should shake us. He says, many in that day will come to me and say, Lord, haven't we done Miracles in your name, prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done money many in your name. And on that day, the Lord will say, depart from me, because I never knew you. So other things, the Bible talks about, it says in Romans or Hebrews chapter six, if we've tasted of the Holy Spirit and of the power of the age to come, and yet we reject Christ, it says that it is impossible to renew those people to repentance again. Like Esau, it's impossible for them to find repentance. Peter and Jude, it says that if somebody 
has had a relationship with Christ, but then rejected the knowledge of Christ. They said it would have been better for them not to have even been born. So I, I personally believe that the scripture teaches us that yes, we come to faith in Christ. We don't earn it by our good works, but true genuine conversion will be demonstrated by a life, not a perfect life, but a life of pursuit of Jesus. And we need to examine ourselves consistently over and over again to make sure that we're in the faith because our hearts can become deceived. Now, I don't think anybody loses their salvation because you've sinned. But I think that perpetually we can harden our heart against the Holy Spirit's conviction to where actually like Hebrews chapter two and three says, it says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. And then it says like the children of Israel, who many of them, God saved them out of Egypt, but many of them could not go into the promised land because of their unbelief, the hardness of their heart. Man, I don't know about you, but that, that messes with me. And our American form of Christianity convinces us, all you gotta do is say a little prayer Get fire insurance, invite Jesus in your heart, make him personal Lord and Savior, and then live however you want to live, and you're once saved, always saved. I would love that to be true. Unfortunately, I don't think the scriptures teach it at all. I think that we can be secure in our salvation, but we need to examine ourselves to make sure that we're really, truly saved, really, truly born again. And the proof of that is fruit. The proof of that is a desire and a love for God to please him. It's a conviction of our soul. And if you are living in such a way that you're just like, well, you know what, when I die, I, I said a prayer when I was five years old and I'm good to go. My dear friend, you have been lied to. Now, when it comes to prodigals, here's, here's what I know, is that God wants people to go to heaven and spend eternity with him more than we do. Sometimes we think, well, God is so mean sending people to hell. But do you know what? If we, if we would really put ourselves up on that pedestal and say that we're better than God, then why is it that we don't pray more? Why is it that we don't witness and share our faith more? Why is it that we don't give more to missions? Why aren't we more actively involved? If we say we believe in heaven and hell, and we say we believe Jesus is the only way, and we say that many, many people are heading for an eternity without Jesus, then what does it say about us that we don't do more? And I'm saying all of us. Well, here's God. You wanna know what he did so that every one of us can be saved and go to heaven? He gave his only begotten son and allowed him to die a brutal death on the cross. And then he raised Jesus from the dead. I would say that God has done a lot more than any of us have ever done so that nobody has to go to hell, that nobody will spend an eternity separated from God so that everybody can come home. But all of us are free will agents. God is not going to force anybody. Here's what I know. Nobody on that day will stand before God and say, it wasn't fair. On that day, nobody, the Bible says, no man will have any excuse on that day. We will have all been given the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. It's what we do with that. And you know what? Life really begins when you find the author of life. I'm a few minutes over, but I wanna share this last story because this is huge. This is recent. We just had our staff, we just had a man in from Iran who is a Iranian leader of the underground church in Iran. And him and his wife, his wife grew up extreme Muslim, wore a burqa, the whole thing had an encounter with the Lord. Her mother was healed of MS. She got radically saved. And so they are under scrutiny in Iran. They lead hundreds of churches in Iran that meet in homes, persecuted believers. Fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. We had that leader, apostolic leader, share with our staff and our elders. His name is Mansoor. It's not his real name. Um, but I was talking with him back in my office and he was explaining to me everything that's going on, how Muslims are getting radically saved in Iran. Like he said, eight, check this out, eight out of 10 Muslims that I share the faith with will get saved in Iran. It's, it's amazing. But he said, Here, here's why. He said, because the sanctions that are on Iran has made it economically difficult. The persecution that they experience 
the, the, the mosques are empty because everybody knows that Islam's a joke. It's not real. Uh, it's demonic. They know uh, the opioid addiction in Iran is mad. So people are hungry and desperate. And I said, why do you think that that's not happening in America? And here's what he said. He said, because how do you tell somebody in America that your good life is actually the enemy of God's great life? He said, in America, people have it too easy. We don't need Jesus, or we don't think we do. He says, in Iran, they're desperate. In America, we have a good life. But I wanna ask you a question this morning, because the Bible, not only have you asked me questions about the Bible, the Bible, Jesus actually asks us questions, some pretty good questions. And the first question I would ask you is this. It's what Jesus said. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. See, that's the American dream. We gain the world. This is all that there is. So it's all about, I gotta live my life to gain notoriety, a sense of fulfillment and pleasure, material possessions. That's the world. Jesus says, what what does it profit? If you gain all that, only to show up at the throne of God and realize that the life that you put everything into that is temporal here is a dot. But eternity is an eternal, non-ending line. And what you do in this dot determines where you will spend eternity in this line. See, we live like this world is everything that's real and that the spiritual stuff is just kind of add-on. No, this is temporary, that's eternal. And the decisions we make in this life matter. Second question that Jesus asks is this. Who do you say that I am? Caesarea Philippi, he says that to his disciples. He said, who do people say that I'm? Well, some say you're a good teacher. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. But who do you say that I am? You know, in our culture today, people acknowledge Jesus. Oh, Jesus was a great teacher. Or Jesus was a prophet. Or Jesus was a spiritual avatar like Muhammad. But Jesus turned to Simon Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ. Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Let me ask you, in the middle of a world that says Jesus is a lot of things, who do you say that Jesus is? Because if he's just a good teacher, well, he's not a savior. If he's just a prophet, he's no different than anybody else. If you say that Jesus is the son of God, he did die on the cross, he was raised from the dead, then that one decision, that one answer should change our perspective on everything about our lives. We should live so drastically different in light of that event. The last question I'll ask you is this, and I want everybody to stand with me all over this room and at Portage as well. The last question I'll ask you is from the book of James. What is your life? What is your life? It gives the answer. It says your life is but a vapor. It's like a puff. Steam that comes out of something and then dissipates. That's how fragile our life is. That's how short it is. We think we have control. We think we're gonna live forever. We think we're gonna be strong. We think we've got control of our life until we don't. You know, I think that the most sobering time in American culture is when, not when we go to church, it's when we go to funerals. Because when we're at funerals, we come to grips with the thing that we don't want to deal with any other time, which is there is an appointment with death. And we have to deal with what's on the other side of that. What's your life? Do you know that you'll never see a U-Haul pulled behind a hearse? Because what you gain in this life won't go with you into that life. The only thing that you take from this life into eternity is your relationship with Jesus Christ, the decisions you make here about who Jesus is. So do you want your treasure to be in heaven? Do you want your life and your hope to be secure in God, your creator? 
or are you gonna build your security here? Jesus calls us to surrender, absolute surrender. The Bible says if we believe in our heart, faith, in Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that God saw us broken, and he sent Jesus, his son, to come for us, to pay a bill that we could never afford to pay, to release us from the power of death through his resurrection. And he calls all men to repent. Repent means turn around. You're walking this way, where the word repent means make a 180 degree and go the opposite way. We've all been walking like a prodigal away from God, thinking we've got it under control. We've got to live for ourselves. And Jesus screams to us, repent, turn around. And when we turn around, you want to know what we see? We don't see an angry God of judgment who wants to give us what we deserve. We see a loving father with outstretched arms that wants to give us what we don't deserve. He wants to give us amnesty. He wants to give us forgiveness. He wants to give us eternal life. Today, if you're trying to earn right standing with God, you will be a miserable failure at that because you're not good enough. But today, if you come to God by faith through Jesus Christ and you surrender your life and you repent of the way that you've been living and you lay it all down and you let God give you the gift of eternal life. Today, you'll be saved not only now, but for eternity. And for eternity, you will look back on a day like today where you stood in church in a given moment in your vapor of a life and you allowed eternity to break through into your heart and change and transform you from the inside out. I want you to bow your heads with me all over the room, if you would. You see, you you can't see the spiritual reality with your naked eye, but you can sense it with your soul. Just like right now, I sense the presence of the Father here to save those who are lost. You know that before you can be saved, you have to recognize you're lost. And that means us acknowledging that. Today, I I just know there are many people here, you believe in God, but you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. You've gone to church, but you've never repented of your sin and received forgiveness. You've been a fan of Jesus, but you've never repented and decided to become a follower of Jesus. And today, you know in your heart of hearts, you're not right with God. But today, the spirit of the living God is moving on your heart, and you know today's the day I want to be saved. I want God to save me rescue me. I want to receive eternal life. I want Jesus to become the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to say I'm sorry to God and let him forgive me and come in and fill my life. I want to get right with God today. All over this room, all over at Portage, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. And when you hear me say three, if you say today, God saved me, Jesus saved me, I want to get right with God. When you hear me say three, I want you to get ready to shoot your hand up in the air, hold it up, and we're going to pray together as soon as you've taken that step in God's direction. Here we go. One, two, three. Raise it up all over the room and hold it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see your hand. Just raise it where you're at. I don't want to miss anybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see your hand. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, 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 yes. See hands all over the room. Thank you, young lady. God sees your hand all the way in the back. Over at Portage, God sees your hands. You can put your hands down. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, it says, if we believe on our heart, in our hearts, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that God raised him from the dead, and if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, we will be saved. So God invites us to just invite him. And I'm gonna lead us all in a prayer. Everyone who's hearing me is gonna say it, whether you've said it before or not. We're all saying this together. We're gonna invite Jesus to come in and be our Lord and Savior. Here we go. Everybody together say, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe he is the Son of God who came to die in my place, die my death, pay for my sin. And I believe he was raised from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. Today, I repent of all of my sins. 
all of my life. And I turn today to follow Jesus. I surrender all. Jesus, come and fill my heart. Sit on the throne and be my king and my master. Thank you for loving me, saving me. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the kingdom of God.